Okay, hi. I'm Gabrielle Gaustad. I'm an associate professor in the Golisano Institute for Sustainability at the Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York. Uh, thank you so much to the NextGen PV uh, group for inviting me to take part in this lecture series, especially uh, Kristen Fine, um, who uh, was my connection to this group. Today I'm going to be talking about scarcity and criticality of PV relevant materials with a focus on recycling as a mitigation strategy. Uh, I kind of do things in reverse order by starting with acknowledgements uh, because this work, of course, is supported by my student research group, including um, some alums, Dr. Michelle Bustamante and Dr. Michelle Goh, uh, and some current students, Berlin uh, Hubler and Vaskin Jajolari, as well as some colleagues here at RIT um, and colleagues at MIT, Dr. Elisa Alonzo, Dr. Kelly Babbitt, and Dr. Brian Tomasuski. And then I'd like to acknowledge my funding source. The majority of this work has been funded uh, through an NSF career award. So just some background on myself before I uh, get into some of the research work. Uh, I actually have a BS in ceramic engineering from Alfred University, which is just down the road from RIT in central New York. And then I went on to MIT to get an MS in computation for design and optimization and a PhD in material science. So you'll see that a lot of my work is a blend of traditional materials characterization techniques and then a lot of computational modeling methods. And then I came here to RIT uh, where I work in the Gulf. Balsano Institute for Sustainability. Uh, it's actually a very unique multidisciplinary um, program that houses degrees um, focused in sustainability. We have a PhD in sustainability, an MS in sustainable systems, and an MR uh, degree in sustainable architecture. So uh, if anybody's interested in some graduate work, uh, feel free to contact me after. So my research area focuses on economic and environmental considerations for materials with a focus on their end of life. So my research group does work looking at compositional barriers to recycling, how consumers behave at end of life, you know, how, how they dispose of, of materials and products that they have, um, some traditional lab scale recycling technology development, and also economic and environmental assessment of those recycling technologies. I do work quantifying environmental impacts of materials at their end of life. And then most of what I'm going to be focusing on for this particular talk is the mitigation of scarcity and criticality issues. So this is looking at supply chains of materials and then um, not only where they come from, but then as secondary sources, can we use recycling as a mitigation technique for some of these issues? So of course, um, I'll be focusing on photovoltaic or solar cell uh, technologies and materials for this talk, but uh, my research group also has projects looking at lithium ion batteries, uh, aluminum and steel, uh, critical, other critical materials like rare earth elements, uh, and nano-enabled products and other electronic waste. So while it may look very glamorous and sound glamorous, sort of like that top picture of photovoltaic panels, the reality of my work is often um, climbing over giant mounds of trash and scrap. So that's kind of the reality of recycling technology research. So uh, like I mentioned before, the methods in my research group are a combination of uh, computational and systems analysis, so things like dynamic material flow assessment, life cycle assessment, optimization and numerical simulation, process-based cost modeling and system dynamics. And those, are, those techniques are combined with traditional material characterization techniques like X-ray fluorescence, particle size distribution, um, differential scanning cal calorimetry, mic microscopy type um, methods like SEM, TEM, and EDS, and uh, inductively coupled plasma uh, optical emission spectroscopy. So those are all traditional material characterization uh, techniques. 
So what I'm going to be focusing on today is this idea of criticality and scarcity in terms of PV materials. So what is criticality? So um, if we look up the traditional uh, definition, there's kind of two key aspects to defining what criticality is. One is this idea of being very important. So something that is crucial, indispensable, or vital. And then the second definition has to do with um, being at a point of crisis, potentially. And so what criticality is really used for here is as a metric for material resources that includes ideas about scarcity, but goes even beyond scarcity to capture um, sort of the risk associated with the use of materials, and then also a measure of how important or how indispensable those materials are to whatever technology, market sector, industry we might be interested in. So the reason this is important is because most clean energy uh, technologies rely heavily on the use of critical materials. So um, a lot of our rare earth elements, uh, strong magnets like neodymium um, and dysprosium and praseodymium, those are in the motors and generators of wind turbines. Uh, things like uh, lithium and cobalt, which may be of concern, are in batteries for energy storage and in electric vehicles. And then what I'll be focusing on today are the materials within solar technology. So you can see many of the materials that we rely on for PV are considered to be critical. So how do we go about measuring this scarcity or criticality? There's two key leverage points. Uh, one is the actual physical resource constraint, and the other is one that we kind of refer to as institutional inefficiency. So the physical resource constraint is kind of the easiest one to understand. This is the amount and quality of a resource that's actually physically determined. So how much material is actually there, whether that's in the ground or whatever physical uh, product or ore, whatever we might be talking about. Institutional um, inefficiency is failures by markets or firms or governments that might result in some sort of um, resource unavailability for a certain temporal period. So the material is there, but we can't get to it for some reason. So we typically measure physical resource constraints with things like reserves, resources, resource base. And we might look at things um, that would contribute to institutional efficiency by looking at, um, say, how diversified a market is. So uh, this other graph is actually showing share of world production for several important uh, PV relevant materials. You can see that these markets are becoming less and less diversified. We're getting these materials from only a few places, which uh, may mean that uh, some of these transitory effects could happen more often. A little historical perspective on uh, the physical constraint side, uh, we sort of have two scholars that uh, developed a lot of the metrics that we use in this area. The first was Malthus, who all the way back in 1798 said that, you know, extraction is exhausting resources. It'd be nice to be a researcher then, like a PhD, you probably have an easy time uh, creating a novel dissertation topic if, if uh, just saying that Extraction exhaust resources is a pretty novel thing. And uh, then Ricardo came after and said, well, it's not just about the actual resources. Resources actually exist in differing quality levels. So scarcity is actually something that happens from that increasing difficulty and the cost of accessing those materials. So we have a set of what we call Malthusian metrics that I really try to get at this idea of extraction exhausting resources. These are things like the static index of depletion or rate of discovery for materials. And then we have Ricardian metrics that try to get more at the quality aspect of it. So these are usually things that also incorporate price or might incorporate compositional quality, whether that's ore grade or um, the compositional amount in certain products. So um, one of the things that my group does in terms of trying to get at this physical resource quantification question 
is really look at where our material is coming from. So this is a mix of material flow analysis and supply chain studies. So part of this is actual material characterization. So how much material is in things, whether we're talking about an ore or if we're focusing on secondary. And then the other part of it's modeling is just understanding where these materials are, where they're flowing to, and what the supply and demand dynamics are. So some of the work we look at uh, asks the question of when it might make sense to get a certain material from ore versus a secondary resource, right? So we look at things like how much is in those ores versus what's in in-stock uses for th in end-of-life products. We look at the composition, so that might be a trade-off between ore grade and concentration by weight in products. And then, of course, the actual recovery technologies, whether that's some kind of froth flotation or beneficiation in terms of mining, or whether that's some kind of hydrometallurgical or pyrometallurgical leaching of metals from, say, some electronic source. On the institutional inefficiency side, uh, a great example of this was um, the cobalt crisis in the late 1970s. So back in 1977, Zaire, um, which at the time was Zaire, it's now the um, Democratic Republic of the Congo, had about, controlled about 40% of cobalt resources. So not even a majority, but a good amount. And a small scale rebellion in 1978 basically led to supplies from that 40% of the mines in that area to be cut off for a short term amount of time. This actually had a huge impact on the market. So even though it was very short term, uh, the price shot up substantially. Um, and actually, a lot of semiconductor uh, industry was hurt. The marginal producers in the semiconductor industry actually went out of business. And it caused a lot of changes in the market overall. So things like uh, some social changes. There was a the geographic supply relocation, which impacted uh, jobs. Uh, economically, there was a lot of substitution happening in the market, um, other market changes, and uh, some environmental things happened too. Uh, a lot of firms started to look more closely at whether they could recycle some of their cobalt resources. They, uh, the great efficiency gains were actually made at that time. So even though the cobalt was there, these kinds of disruptions can have a huge impact um, on the markets that they affect. One of the key challenges in the current metrics that uh, my research group is focusing on is that many of them ignore the interconnectedness of material systems. So for example, if you were looking at this Malthusian metric of index of depletion, you would just focus on the material that you're interested in. So say that's tellurium, you would, you would say, all right, how much tellurium is available out there? How much are we demanding right now? Okay, that ratio gives us some index of depletion. But the reality is that uh, most of these material systems are very interconnected. So um, we have these sort of carrier metals, which are, are, large are um, mined in large volumes, then we actually get a lot of these other materials as byproducts of those carrier metals. So uh, sometimes you hear that referred to as daughter mining. Um, you know, we, we talk about it as being a byproduct or co-product mining. And then depending on how much value those byproducts or co-products have um, will impact how they're sold in the market in terms of a commodity. And so if you, if you look at this other graph, this is actually showing the companion index. So that's basically how much um, of those materials are uh, being mined as only a byproduct of another material. So the ones in red mean that there's almost no direct mining, direct recovery of those materials. Okay, So you'll see a lot of those um, materials that are in red are of course the materials that um, are essential for solar applications, right? And this issue is actually increasing as solar is evolving because we're moving towards these more complex material systems that use more and more and small amounts um, of these critical metals. And in terms of what's coming in the next generation, 
Um, I'm sure they'll continue to increase in complexity in terms of number of materials used. Uh, for example, uh, a lot of people are looking at these spectral conversion cells that uh, have a lot of these rare earth element doped phosphors uh, in conjunction with multi-junction PV, which already um, have a lot of materials that are critical, such as indium and gallium, germanium. So, you know, as, as these technologies are evolving, the dynamics of these material systems are also changing. So, um, what our group looks at is this process of bioproduction in terms of what's coming out of the ore as major and minor materials. We look at the uh, commodity pricing. Um, hold on. I'm not moving enough here, I guess. Let me just turn my light on really quick. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, we also look at the uh, commodity pricing and how that relates to those market dynamics. And then in terms of the interaction between the carrier metal supply chain and the byproduct uh, supply chain, of course, what we're interested in is will we have enough of these byproduct metals to roll out large scale clean energy? Um, and then we look at, uh, in terms of answering that question, which is somewhat complicated, where can we employ interventions if there is a problem to ensure that we do have enough of those? So maybe it makes sense to look at technology interventions or policy interventions for either the carrier or the byproduct metal supply chains. So to show you an example of some of what we've been looking at, um, this is the copper tellurium byproduct supply chain. So it's a, a very interesting material system. Copper um, is produced in a few different ways. Primary copper mainly comes from copper sulfide ores and is produced electrolytically. And that electrolytic process actually produces this copper byproduct, which is an anode slime in the refining process. And from that anode slime, we're actually able to recover tellurium from this. Now, um, there's other dynamics in copper production that are changing um, how, how much tellurium is available to get out. So for example, an SXEW is a new technological process that's able to increase efficiency of um, copper production, but does not have tellurium produced um, as a byproduct. Also, uh, secondary, so recycling of copper has been increasing over time as well because of the economics there. And of course, tellurium is not a byproduct of secondary production. So we might look at, say, uh, the demand of, say, CADTEL PV, which uh, relies on tellurium, and then ask the question of, is it possible to maybe recycle that material to offset some of the issues um, that might occur because uh, tellurium is this critical with potential scarcity issues type of source. Of course, there's a lot of um, complexity that goes into this. So the first part's really understanding that copper supply. So as I said before, secondary um, is somewhat stagnant, maybe decreasing slightly. Um, primary copper production is decreasing over time, and this SXEW process is increasing. So that means overall, all of these routes, because only primary electrolytic copper production is yielding tellurium, we're actually having less and less processing that might yield this tellurium. Then we look at things like yield. So how much tellurium do we actually get from the copper production process, meaning how what's the yield from this anode slime that's a byproduct from copper production? And then with that, what's the demand or tellurium. So part of that is material intensity. So you might look at, say, a proxy like film thickness uh, within the P. And then how, how is demand of, of that particular type of PV going to change in the future? Um, will demand increase greatly? Will, will a different type of PV um, take over that, that growth? There's a lot of uncertainty in a lot of those modeling parameters. But what we can do is actually create multiple supply and demand scenarios that are based on the variation of those critical parameters. 
And then we want to look at where a supply gap condition might be, right? So this is actually showing where you would have a gap condition in terms of de demand for tellurium, where your demand is outpacing what's coming out of the copper supply. So in reality, um, you wouldn't actually make it to this point because the scarcity of that material would cause the price to spike so much that probably the market would change um, in response to that price spike. But this helps us sort of determine, you know, how far off this gap onset might be is a metric for determining how critical some of these PV relevant materials may be. So then you can evaluate that risk based on the sensitivity of, of those various metrics. So we might actually say, um, you know, how much will that uh, gap condition change given all of these inputs? So you can see here that the growth rate of PV has one of the strongest um, impacts on when that gap onset would be as expected. Um, material intensity slightly less, but there's a little bit more uncertainty in, in some of those, like a larger range for some of those. And then on the supply side, we could look at um, what that yield would be for tellurium coming out of the anode slime, and also um, how maybe, say, the market for secondary copper is changing. And then given how each of those different input parameters impact the overall risk metric that we're looking at, we can then make either technology or policy recommendations based on those results. So given those results, some short-term recommended actions might be to reduce the material intensity or improve yield. It's going to take much longer to actually develop recycling infrastructure. And then for long-term, maybe we'd recommend to advance direct tellurium mining instead of having it as only be a byproduct. So along with that, um, our group is, is developing other types of novel metrics to try to better get at this interconnectedness of these metal systems in terms of making criticality risk assessments. So one um, option is to look at ecologically inspired metrics. So in ecology, often um, the study of sort of these interconnected groups of, of animals and plants is, is a great analysis in terms of approaching network metrics. So this is an example food web uh, from ecology, but applied to rare earth elements. So you can kind of see the different trophic levels of um, where these materials are going in terms of broader demand. So if we can set up some of these critical materials and understand their supply demand in the sense of a food web, then we can apply other ecologically inspired network analysis metrics to try to um, see uh, better criticality based on that interconnectedness instead of just looking at one material by itself. So you could look at, say, the linkage density. You could look at keystone species. Uh, you could look at diversification metrics. All of these things come, come from ecology, and uh, we have quite a bit of ongoing research right now applying those to critical metal systems. Another is um, looking at more socio-political metrics. So if we can get at these more transitory risks that, that are involved. So this graph is actually showing for some important PV materials, the share of US imports in terms of where we're getting some of these materials. And so uh, one way to look at this is the HHI, the Hirfendahl Hirschman Index, which is a way to measure diversification of markets. It was actually developed by uh, the Department of Justice to look at uh, monopolies in markets. So this, this is a way to measure, say, if there's a monopoly or if there's a low amount of diversification in terms of where your supply is coming from. So we've actually looked at weighting this HHI with uh, other socio-political metrics. So uh, WGI or the uh, World Governance Indicators are a great source of these. So PSAV is an example. This is uh, political stability and absence of violence. It's on a scale of about uh, roughly the main, most countries fall between minus two and a half to two and a half. So you can see here in Somalia, Syria, um, not so politically stable. The U.S. is kind of in the 
the middle, but, but a little bit higher in countries like New Zealand and Greenland are fairly high on this scale. You can also look at regulatory quality. So this is this is um, sort of quality of regulations on trade and things that would affect supply chains and commodity markets. And these are just some example values for some of these material uh, for some of the countries. So then you can weight the HHI for where the materials are coming from and which countries with some of these socio-political weightings. And so we've applied a wide variety. So the political stability and absence of violence, regulatory quality, um, things that measure a degree of democracy like polity. We looked at the fragile states index, uh, development assistance. So we really kind of wanted to ask the question of if we applied all of these different sociopolitical weightings, would we get a different picture in terms of what materials might have the highest criticality issues? Um, so these are these are ranked in order of the uh, PSAV weighting, um, and you can see though that there's a pretty wide discrepancy in in degree of criticality for some of these materials. But a lot of uh, PV relevant materials um, are high in terms of of potentially being in areas where there could be these institutional inefficiency or socio political disruptions in their supply. We also look at combining multiple metrics uh, to try to get a better picture again of this kind of interconnectedness and differing perspectives of criticality. So this is actually showing uh, the primary embodied energy uh, graphed against the primary price. So uh, megajoules per ton versus dollar per ton. And then the circles are actually showing the ratio of, of reserves to production. So a tiny circle means that there's a higher scarcity issue. And then uh, increasing up to the upper right, you're getting increasing risk um, when looking at primary embodied energy and primary price. So you can combine these metrics in a lot of different ways to get a, a more whole picture in terms of how the materials relate to each other and how the byproducts are connected. And the goal of this, of course, is not just to say, oh, no, we have this huge problem. They're critical. <laughs> the the um, real goal is to say, OK, now what? What can we do about this? What can we do to ensure that we have these materials for clean energy rollout? So we like to look at these as uh, various mitigation strategies. So it's important to look across all of the different life cycle phases. And this requires uh, cross-disciplinary, transdisciplinary work uh, to develop and assess a lot of these mitigation strategies. So this is just a couple examples. You know, in extraction, you can look at uh, primary mining, increasing efficiencies there. Within processing, you can look at yield improvement. Within manufacturing, dematerialization or substitution are great strategies. In the use phase, um, you know, increasing lifespan can help. Um, and then at end of life, which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk more about in depth, um, looking at recycling, remanufacturability, those types of things. So one thing our group does is try to um, quantify what the potential for different mitigation strategies might be. So this is, uh, again, looking at the copper tellurium system just as an example case study. If we had some market imbalance, where we have you know, excess demand versus excess supply, right? So this is looking at dematerialization. So can we reduce our film thickness and how much of an impact would that have on the risk or criticality of that material? So our baselines are on three micron, which is um, roughly what we're seeing now, but that range can be huge. Um, there's potential to go all the way down to you know, 0.67 micron. Um, so if we looked at that then in terms of that overall decrease, and this is showing demand minus supply, so down is sort of making progress. So you can see that, that um, dematerialization uh, actually has a pretty strong impact on decreasing um, that supply gap onset. And you can also sort of uh, project that uh, down into sort of the 2D space to look at the delay in terms of that decreasing, right? So from 
from five to three, that decrease doesn't have much of an impact on the on the supply gap onset because your your demand is already increasing too much. And even though you're able to to dematerialize, it's not going to have as much of an impact. But under three, you actually start to see a really strong impact, and that sort of you know very you know, basically at inf infinity around one or so means that once you get to that point, you've actually taken care of the problem. So you're, you've totally mitigated um, a potential demand supply uh, gap at that point. So you can also look at the overall reduction in that peak market imbalance. So not just delaying the gap, but actually decreasing increasing how much that excess is. So this is slightly more linear as we would expect. And then we can also look at the gap duration. So like how long are we in a place where there might be some, some gap there? So this is actually showing a maximum reduction about 86 years um, or roughly 100% of what our baseline is by decreasing that overall film thickness. And like I said before, probably uh, the commodity pricing is going to step in before you would actually get to this long of a supply demand gap. But what these uh, metrics can provide are a, a little bit more information that takes into account all the material interconnectedness, but then also helps us to strategize as to which of these might have more of an impact than the other in terms of mitigation. So this is a different mitigation strategy. This is byproduct yield improvement. So currently um, in that anode slime, uh, we're only able to get about 35% of the contained tellurium out. Um, roughly a, ra a range of up to 80% though has been shown to be possible in lab scale trials. So this is actually showing if we were able to achieve that lab scale extraction yield efficiency um, how much we'd be able to offset the demand uh, supply gap onset. And this is actually showing for recycling. So uh, currently very little cattail PV is, is recycled, but potentially that, that, could, that could grow quite a bit. And so we looked at scenarios from almost nothing to 100% recycling rate to see how that too would actually impact the overall demand and supply. And of course, because it's going to take time to build up that much infrastructure to get those high collection rates, um, it takes much longer in terms of time to actually see an impact from recycling. To kind of continue along looking at recycling, not only does, does my group sort of look at um, that the supply demand interaction of the supply chains, but also trying to understand um, how recycling might uh, have implications for the market overall. So um, this is some work that actually looks at how the energy payback time would change uh, for different degrees of recycling for different uh, PV material systems. So the little asterisk is indicating uh, roughly the current module efficiency. This paper is one or two years old, so I'm sure the efficiency has increased even more since then. Um, and then the line is actually showing current municipal solid waste recycling rates for all of the contained materials in that technology. The bar then represents um, the whole span of no recycling, that would be the top part, all the way to exhaustive recycling, where every material is completely recycled in the process. So of course, the, the municipal solid waste rates are a little closer to the no recycling because uh, most of the materials contained have, have fairly low recycling rates in, in current uh, MSW material recovery facilities or MRFs, uh, the exceptions being uh, some of the frame materials, so aluminum and steel, some glass uh, is currently recycled in those streams. So basically you can see that um, there's a huge range, so really um, uh, it can very much impact the, the energy payback time to recycle some of these materials. And of course the question of does it make sense is always, it depends, right? So it has the potential to reduce the energy payback time. The real issue here, though, are assumptions about transportation and collection. So if you really want to comprehend um, the, the energy involved, 
the emissions uh, involved, the costs involved um, with collection and transportation, you really have to get into the nitty gritty of uh, the geospatially relevant statistics. So this is a case study that we did for New York State where we looked at uh, different demand points. So this is PV uh, that's, been, that's been rolled out and then ask the question of, does it make sense to have um, distributed or centralized collection, right? So the trade-off there is if you have more distributed um, collection, you're gonna get higher rates of collection because you're gonna be more places and probably get more materials, um, but you won't have as specialized of facilities, so you, you won't be able to uh, get at and process the the high number of materials contained in these. On the flip side, if you have centralized, you're gonna to have to transport those materials much farther to be processed, but um, because then you can have a very specialized facility, you can get much more of those materials. And so the question really is, should we take advantage of the current network of material recovery facilities that we have, or should we roll out very specific uh, PV uh, type technologies? I'm just gonna let that go dark. Maybe you can still see my face in the, the glow of my computer. And so, of course, this, this requires um, GIS in terms of geographic information systems combined with some type of optimization. And as the feed-ins for this, you need to have an understanding of the yield for the recycling processes that are possible given distributed versus centralized, and then um, also what those likely collection rates might be. So one of the first things we looked at was actually whether this was economically feasible. So um, given some of the different lab scale and starting to be um, industrially scaled up end of life processing steps, what would the cost look like in terms of a trade-off in terms of, of those collection rates? And interestingly enough, you do get kind of this sweet spot for the, for the cost considerations. So as, as your um, collection rate is increasing, you know, your unit costs are decreasing because you're starting to get those economies of scale. But after a certain uh, point, those start to, to kind of go, go up again, right? So this, this would uh, indicate that um, you know, fully distributed and fully centralized is not really the way to go, but we, we need to find out where that sweet spot is in the middle of having multiple collection sites with some degree of specialization for getting those materials. So from this though, we kind of asked the question of what would a larger case look like? So beyond just New York State, and really, though, we wanted to get at the environmental impacts of this as well. So that's really what we're focusing on in terms of the overall sustainability implications of these mitigation techniques. So um, to do a life cycle assessment, though, of these materials, you start to get in the same territory that you know, I already discussed a little bit in terms of you really have to comprehend the interconnectedness of the carrier byproduct material system. One reason for that is because of the allocation methods that are a part of any sort of life cycle assessment um, methodology. So when you do a life cycle uh, assessment, you have to decide you know, what materials are getting the various burdens and credits. And that's a challenging thing to do when you have all these PV materials that are actually byproducts of these carrier metals. So who, who is gonna get all of that environmental burden? Who's gonna get the credit? So, you know, in, in a lot of allocation methods, they're based on either the mass, so the, the flows of the mass, masses through the process, or on the economics, right? So again, this, this is very challenging because you have to understand what the yields are of those various materials and the commodity pricing in these material systems is extremely volatile as well. So uh, that's definitely the case for tellurium, but it's the case for a lot of these other materials as well. Indium has seen extreme volatility in the last few years. Germanium, gallium, arsenic, a lot of these materials uh, have quite a bit of volatility. So you can see here the flow all the way from the copper ore that's coming from these sulfide ores 
to these various byproducts that are coming off all the way to the semiconductor grade tellurium. So you can kind of see how the, the unit value, the allocation splits, and then the mass reference flows all result in some, in some very kind of different assumptions that go into it. And what we found is that those byproduct assumptions uh, actually matter a great deal uh, in the results of the life cycle assessment. So this is showing the cumulative energy demand in megajoules per kilogram for both economic based methods and mass based methods. Some of these are from previous literature and then some of these are from the study that uh, our group did, which is published in uh, solar energy materials and solar cells. So you can see that those assumptions actually result in very different cumulative energy demands. This is for tellurium. So if we were going to say how many megajoules per kilogram does it take to produce the tellurium that's used in our PV, depending on how you make those byproduct assumptions, you might get very, very different answers. So anywhere from 105 megajoules per kilogram all the way up to 825 megajoules per kilogram. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end there so we, we have a good amount of time for some questions. Just to summarize, um, my work looks at those trade-offs of economic and environmental quantification uh, for materials with a focus on end of life, uh, trying to focus on recycling and resource recovery, and um, really emphasizing the implications of scarcity and criticality for clean energy technologies. So some of um, the resources that um, I can offer if people are interested in collaboration are those material compositional characterization, environmental impact assessment and material flows, and then a lot of that modeling and programming that we use for quantification. Some resources and skills that I'm looking for are uh, students interested in uh, cross-disciplinary graduate research. Uh, we have some projects upcoming where we'd like to look at um, some surveys of companies and how they're approaching mitigation techniques with a focus on substitution. Um, I'm also looking for uh, folks with uh, mathematical epidemiology skills, uh, folks versed in resource conflict, and people who do commodity trading and modeling. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm just going to turn my light back on <laughs> before questions. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. Uh, we've got a few questions here in the chat window. Um, some of them okay. are a bit, a bit lengthy, so it's probably easier for you to read through them yourself. Okay. Yeah. Um, here, let me just uh, get this in a view here. Okay. So the first one is historical examples of shortages that harmed industry. Um, with uh, the proposition being that companies do pretty pretty good job of this. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, the, the cobalt example, there's several semiconductor companies that actually went completely out of business um, because they, they just weren't able to, uh, to, to innovate, to substitute fast enough. So I mean, I don't know if you could say that that harmed the industry. I don't know. Maybe it's survival of the fittest <laughs> in some of those industries. So those problems maybe, you know, cut out the marginal producers. So you could kind of say that that doesn't matter. Although, you know, the people running those companies and working for them would probably disagree <laughs> and, uh, and say that that was a, a big impact. Um, other times, uh, consumers, uh, well, the companies are pretty good at passing those increased costs on to consumers, oftentimes. Um, so, um, I, you know, like uh, GE is a great example. They, you know, they've had some problems with, say, like rhenium supply for some of their healthcare products. Um, you know, they, they would say they've been severely impacted by price increases. I mean, they haven't they haven't gone out of business. Um, you know, I think I, I agree that most of the time companies are going to are going to innovate and um, make some changes to to deal with um, any kind of sort of scarcity issue. 
probably where it comes in more problematic is in the court of public opinion and those are more from material shortage issues that are socio-political in nature. So, um, you know, for example, when um, some of those strikes in, in Zaire, well, the Congo now, um, you know, there were, there were photographs of kids, you know, smashing up cobalt and working in the mines. And so some of that, I think, had a larger impact in terms of hurting companies in terms of buying products than necessarily the material shortage itself. And I think I think a lot of companies now are very sensitive to socio-political issues in the supply chain, almost more so than scarcity issues. Um, I'm sure there's some other examples. I can definitely, you can shoot me an email and I can send you some um, some citations uh, for you of those some of those examples. Um, let's see here. Um, the next question, oh yeah, so lithium. Uh, yeah, so I, I do a lot of research um, on, on lithium ion batteries, uh, recycling technology, supply chain for those as well. Lithium is something that uh, has been kind of hotly contested, you know, for a while they're like, we're going to run out of lithium. and then a lot of people are like, we're never going to run out of lithium. And I, I think ev uh, the consensus is more on the side of, you know, we're, we're not going to run out per se. I mean, there's like an infinite source in the ocean and, and, and those kinds of places. But I think the, um, the, the, the issue there more so is sort of this idea of the real shortage being energy, right? So how these materials are produced can be extremely energy intensive. Um, and a lot of times, you know, uh, emission intensive, environmental impact intensive. And so I think a lot of people are moving more towards looking at those aspects of criticality metrics, as opposed to just focusing on the actual material shortage. And I think that's one where lithium is, is, in, is in that market. I think I think what's really interesting too is the institutional inefficiency side of it as well. So for for some of those markets, um, they're extremely not diversified. You know, like China is always the example that that people bring up. You know, more and more of of the extraction and processing is happening there. And it's not so much that, oh, we're afraid China's going to cut off supply. Well, some people are very afraid of that, but other more moderate people are less afraid about China cutting off supply. But the issue is if your material's only coming from one place, something can happen to that one place that you wouldn't be able to get the material. And that's where the, the, the price spikes might um, cause a problem. I mean, it could, you could even be, you know, a hurricane hits a refinery, um, or there's an earthquake that disrupts the, the mines or, you know, even health impacts um, might, might cause uh, a, a gap in supply. And it's those uh, short-term price spikes that can actually really have some negative consequences for, for a lot of the companies. And clean energy is especially uh, vulnerable to those kinds of things because, um, you know, in, in, in some cases, they're not even totally through the, the, you know, valley of death in terms of rollout yet. So um, it, it's those more kind of vulnerable marginal firms that I think is a concern for, for supply. Sorry, I'm getting behind a little bit. <laughs> um, Oh yeah, so that's a it's a great question. How much do price increases in the material affect the final cost? Um, less and less, which is awesome, right? I mean, uh, it used to be that the the materials were a large portion of what what the PV cost is. Uh, now that's not true anymore. Um, I think uh, the I was at photovoltaic specialist conference. 
Uh, and one of the plenary said, you know, making friends with your bank is actually <laughs> the biggest, the biggest thing you can do because it's the financing that has the largest impact now in terms of cost. So, um, you know, some, some of these, uh, price uh, issues are becoming less and less because the, the material prices is, is affecting it less. But that being said, some of some of these materials have had shockingly large uh, increases in cost. So, I mean, indium, you know, I said, I, I think somebody said something like, oh, even a five fold price increase wouldn't have have a difference. But we've routinely seen five fold price increases. Uh, in some of these commodity markets like indium and germanium. So um, it's not out of the realm of, of reality that you would see like a several fold price increase that, that could that could uh, happen because of a of a supply constraint or other volatility within the commodity market. But yeah, I think I think we're moving away. PV for sure is moving away um, from the material cost being as relevant as it used to be, which is which is probably a good thing. Um, let's yeah, yeah, so, um, yeah, so the battery market, um, I mean, it depends what you're talking about in terms of the battery market. So I'm looking at Matt's question on, on lithium. Um, yeah, so uh, previously and still, I think lubricants is a, is a fairly large consumer. Um, the, but yeah, near-term probability of, of cost increases is, isn't necessarily low as the largest volume consumer can't support that price increase. They're the, they're the price consumer that's going to probably be, be hit the most, right? So it's going to be these, the, even though they use a large volume, they're the ones who are going to have to innovate faster because as the price increases, they're going to be the first to be shut out in terms of, of competing, competing demand sectors. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's fairly complicated because uh, within the commodity market itself, you sort of have to look at what these competing sectors are and how elastic, inelastic their particular demand is, and how much um, how able they are to pass price increases off to their consumer. So that that varies quite a bit as well. Um, Um, yeah, lubricant markets, interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure you can really say that they won't let their, um, it says you, they won't let their share go even if prices go up. I mean, you'd be surprised. Their share will definitely decrease if the price increases substantially. And we, you know, we've seen that in other markets. Um, but I mean, it's, it's hard to know exactly. Um, there are other sources. Oh, yeah, yeah. So there's definitely, um, yeah, yeah. So um, I work with several people at First Solar. Uh, they've, they're definitely demonstrating internal recycling. They're very interested in direct mining. Um, it's just not economically feasible yet. So, I mean, I think I think it comes down to the the price and the commodity market trade-offs as to what's actually going to end up being viable. So um, yeah, there's tellurium all over the place. There's tellurium in in a lot of our gold mines. I mean, we have we have tellurium in the in the southwest of our country. We could be direct mining that, but we're not because <laughs> it doesn't doesn't make sense for us to do that. Um, all of all of our tellurium is is coming from this this copper process, even though there's certainly you know other other potential ways of getting it, including recycling, which we're not we're not getting any from from recycling yet either. But yes, yeah, First Solar's uh, working on that. Um, uh, Parakeet Sinha gave a great talk on that at PVSC. I talk to him often about <laughs> their uh, internal recycling process and. Yeah, they're definitely working on getting that uh, scaled up. Uh, how do you account for different contract types? 
Yeah, so um, hedging is really interesting. Uh, we we look at at hedging and and diversification, long term contracts. Um, you know, an, another thing that's really interesting is actually stockpiling. So um, I do some work with the Defense Logistics Agency, which is the arm of the Department of Defense that actually stockpiles some of these critical materials for U.S. based manufacturing. And so they, um, uh, they're one that uh, considers, um, it, I mean, their, their main focus is stockpiling, even though they could be doing more hedging and more sort of long, longer term contracts to ensure some of those materials. I think, I think their view is um, the, the long term contracting and hedging is really, um, only only useful given like a certain change in the market like if things get too extreme those um there's you you can't guarantee necessarily those long-term contracts right so their their focus is more so on stockpiling because they want that physical resource in hand i mean if if the if the market had a very large increase this actually happened with cobalt with that example in the 70s right so people had the semiconductor industry, they do hedging, they do some of these longer term, um, you know, uh, bilateral contracts as well. But when the when the uh, price, you know, had a five fold increase, it didn't really matter. I mean, they they may have had a contract, but they didn't have the material. So um, I, I think I think looking fi uh, using financial based modeling, commodity trading and modeling to understand how those smaller changes might impact is, is really useful and, and interesting. Um, help, definitely helps with forecasting. But I think um, in some of these, you know, temporal sort of large scale transitory issues, sometimes those mitigation strategies kind of go kind of go out the window because they, you know, if you if if you can't get the material, it doesn't really matter what your what your contracts are saying. Obscure spot markets. Yeah. And I'd be happy to talk at length with anybody about any of these things. Um, after as well, you know, shoot me shoot me an email. We can set up a, a conference call. I could talk for hours about this stuff. <laughs> all right. Uh, it looks like Maybe all of our questions have answered. Does, does anyone else have any anything for Gabrielle before we uh, close up? Maybe maybe one more coming. Okay. Oh yeah. So um, yeah. If, is my screen still sharing? I guess not. Yeah, shoot me an email. I'm happy to happy to chat. You guys can follow me on Twitter. I'm always tweeting about uh, critical metal markets, supply chains. Put my Twitter handle in. All right. Well, thank you, Gabrielle. And and for those of you who joined us for the first time, we'll have a video of this up on YouTube and. Uh, um, I'll send it to her so that she can share it, and, and that way uh, other folks can, can tune in and see this presentation at a later date. Yeah, great. Thanks so much for having me. We really appreciate it, and, and let us know if you'd ever like to give a, an update or, or speak on another topic. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thanks again. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.